Hello, I'm Ray DiGiuseppe. I'm the Director of Professional Education here at the Albert Ellis Institute. And we're about to go over one of our master video series. Uh, for a long time now, we've been making video recordings of psychotherapy sessions done by people that we think are really master psychotherapists for the education of the uh, different mental health professionals. Today, I'm sitting here with Dr. Steve Johnson. Uh, Steve has spent most of his career working with religious clients, and we're going to work with a uh, client uh, that has uh, strong religious beliefs. Many Americans, and matter of fact, maybe most, have uh, strong religious beliefs, and the uh, mental health community and psychotherapy training centers usually don't talk about working with religious clients and what kind of problems and opportunities that uh, poses for psychotherapists. So this uh, is a case example. So Steve, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, as you said, Steve Johnson. I was, uh, many years ago, a postdoc here at the Albert Ellis Institute, became a fellow, uh, proved supervisor, then went on to become the, the founder of an affiliate training center in Connecticut, where I tend to work primarily with uh, a more conservative Jewish and Christian clients who really want to integrate their faith into their psychotherapy. We don't hear too much about psychotherapists doing that, so this is right. kind of a unique opportunity to see how that's done. Right, okay. right. All right. Steve, tell us a little bit about this client before we begin to uh, watch the video. Uh, I had never met him mm -hmm. uh, before. He um, twenty in his early 20s and presented with um, um, depression over a, a long period of time um, uh, as a result of some sexual abuse and um, was having difficulty integrating his faith with this and how to respond as a Christian mm -hmm. in the face of that kind of So it's kind of a spoiler alert for the audience. That yeah. there, there's this big tr uh, trauma that's going to come out somewhere right. and they can sort of watch to see how it does come out and maybe which steps you take because you don't know this in the beginning I didn't of the session. You didn't know this I in the beginning know. of the sessions. Okay, let's watch. So Wesley, thank you for coming in. And what would you like to talk about today? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I think for me, this last Christmas, I had kind of a crisis um, of emotion in dealing with some abuse from my past. Mm. And it brought up a lot of shame and um, specifically in relating to other people. And it was all triggered around kind of a relationship that I was, you know, kind of moving in towards but uncertain about. And um, the individual that I was pursuing had kind of some similar background. And so there was this kind of clash and then it ended in um, just this kind of negative space. And so in that space of like not communicating, um, I really kind of got lost in this sense of confusion. And I realized that there was a lot still in there that I thought might, I might have dealt with, but mm. in reality it seems to just have been buried. I'm not sure that I got everything, so okay. let me just run a few things that, that I heard and okay. you tell me if I've got this right or right. right. That this, just this past Christmas, yes. this was it, and, and this was the kind of the ending of a relationship, or you were pursuing a relationship and it, it was more, blew up? It was or? more towards like beginning one. The beginning right. of, the, of a relationship. And then it blew up before and, it could go anywhere kind okay. of thing. And so when it blew up, then you, that was when you began to experience the, the shame, right. this confusion, mm -hmm. et cetera. Was there anything other than shame that you were feeling at that time? Um, let's see. I think shame was one of the most identifiable ones. Mm. Um, I think, I don't think I've ever been depressed but okay. I would say that that was as close as I've come in the fact of like, not nihilism, but having like this, not being able to see a meaning or a purpose to things mm -hmm. and also ha struggling with like where I'm going and what I'm doing, I guess, in that sense. Um, you know, there's been times in, in life where like I didn't know what was going on and it's always kind of brought this anxiety of like uncertainty and this kind of triggered all of that back into something where I felt like I knew what I was doing, but then it was like, after this happened, I was like, I must not know what I'm doing because okay, so I feel awful. 
kind of, it sounds like kind of lost and unbalanced. Right. Is that what Everything it was, was kind of thrown out of balance. Okay. And it caused me to think that I'd never really had it balanced, but it was uh, more of like a mask I was putting over. So lots of self-doubt. Right. Okay. That's so it. you mentioned anxiety. Did you have anxiety then with the shame there at Christmas, or was it just primarily shame? It was more shame during Christmas, and then as that kind of went on, it was more uh, of an anxiety of like, I don't know what's happening inside. Okay. okay. Which would you like to focus on? The, you know, the, the shame or the anxiety? I think the shame. The shame. Yeah. Hi, Steve. We're only a couple minutes into this session, and uh, he's really revealed a lot of information to you. Right. Um, we know now that uh, there is some kind of crisis that he has, that uh, it seems that the crisis is a little different than just the breakup of the romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. And he gives you a couple of emotions, and you seem to, uh, uh, or at least you have a good goal now. You set a goal with him. And right. Yeah, he... Um, I know often people think that in REBT we're very, very, very directive, but I think this demonstrates he showed, he, he mentioned shame right. and anxiety, and I asked him which he wanted. Right. And depression, so and he, depression. he had a couple of emotions, and right. you kind of zeroed in on which emotion was the most uh, important for him. Important for him, right. and, he, and he chose. When he says shame, does that sort of trigger anything for you that you want to look for going down the line? Well, it did make me look at um, whether there is some guilt with um, um, maybe underlying all of this, mm -hmm. some problem with uh, unconditional self-acceptance. Okay. So it's a theory in the back of my mind. So in your head, you, watching you got not some idea that he's not accepting himself or condemning himself, given right. the emotion that he's chosen to work right. with. Right. Okay, great. Let's watch this. I think it's more closely tied with the past okay. than anxiety is. And it, it comes first, and then after that, you get right. the, the anxiety. Okay. What would you like to feel other than shame? Um, I would like to feel like, I don't know, almost like what I feel in the shame is that there's something wrong with me. Ah. And I, I would rather feel like, I don't know, like whole again, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And if you thought of yourself as whole, mm -hmm. what do you think would be the emotion you would experience other than shame? I would think it would be like um, a healthy confidence, specifically in relationships and, uh -huh. um, yeah. Confidence. Yeah. So that might be something to work toward, and that okay. might take a little while, right? right? So what would you see as an emotion that you would like, kind of as a step to, to that one, you know? Mm. Instead of feeling the shame maybe, I don't know, uh, disappointment. You know what I mean? Right. What, what other emotion would you see? It may not be fully positive, mm -hmm. but it would feel healthier than, to you than shame. Right. You, can you think of one? Putting words to it. I would say, I don't know, affirmation? Is that a step okay. in the right direction? Affirmation of your to? self. Of who I am. Okay. And if you had that, um, okay. So you might not be experiencing joy then, but you would be not kind of uh, beating up on the self. Right. Right? Oh. Mm -hmm. So you did have this hypothesis that he was somehow self-denigrating himself. Right. 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 You didn't really share your hypothesis with him, but it didn't take you very long to get some corroborating information. Huh? Right, right. He was uh, very quick with it, right? I mean, actually, immediately after we narrowed in on an emotion, he brought that up. Right. Yeah. The other thing that I like that you did here is you're asking him for a goal, not just in reducing the shame, but what the replacement emotion mm. would be. In other yeah. words, how's he going to feel if he doesn't feel shame? And it was hard for him to put that in words. It, it, it was, was hard, and I thought maybe it was uh, not immediately within his grasp. Right. So then we were, I think, together negotiating right. uh, something that's doable, something right. more realistic, even though it wouldn't be a, a positive emotion. You also did highlight that this replacement emotion wasn't going to be positive. Right. It's still going to be negative but not disruptive. Yes. That was yes. really an interesting point that he seemed to get right away. He got very quickly. Yeah. Okay, let's watch some more. I think, I mean, in my mind, I would think that joy would come later down the track mm -hmm. and, and the way I would feel like it would work out Okay. in some ways. I don't know what that looks like. But. So that would be kind of a long range. Right. Long range. Just to goal. be happy. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, just to be happy. Yeah. And, 
not beating up on, on yourself. So if we go back to Christmas, okay. okay, and was there a moment when that shame got triggered? Do you remember that? I remember specifically I felt it. I was about to go to bed, mm -hmm. and I looked in the mirror, and it was just like I felt naked with clothes on. I was just felt out of my skin, not comfortable with who I was. And it wasn't because of what I was seeing. It was just like this rush of emotion that had kind of come together. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it, it oftentimes happens to me when there's a juxtaposition of like a moment of great joy, then followed by being alone. So it's like if I have friends come over, we have this big party. Yeah. It's like everything's good in that moment. But then as soon as everything dies away and I'm alone, Mm. It's like it was, n I never had reached a high point at all. It was like it negated it, it all. Yeah. Okay. And it almost it made it feel like the joy wasn't true joy because it was just this mask that I'd put on. And then when I come back and I'm alone, my true self is there and it's facing me and it's lonely and, you know. So you identify that as your, as your, as your true self. Mm -hmm. um, Hi, Steve. One of the things I found really interesting here is you ask him for the activating event or the trigger stimulus for this shame, and he doesn't give you an external event. It wasn't sort of a thing that happened. It's this looking in the mirror, and it's an internal event, mm. right? It's sort right. of like, I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm a fraud. So he has these sort of thoughts and sensations, I'm faking it, that really triggers the shame. Mm, yeah, and and I found that so interesting and, and wanted me to explore that uh, that unconditional self acceptance because he has this false self, real self, and the real self is a negative self. Right, so right. yeah, that that needed to be explored. So it's almost like the object of world isn't so important. The activating event are these yes. internal thoughts and feelings about which he then feels shame, right. which is different than I think that some therapists usually look for an external real thing to happen rather than as an internal one. Yeah, the external thing to me sounded kind of ordinary. Yes. And so I thought there may not be a whole lot there. So he brought it to an internal event, so I, I went with it. Okay, let's see what happens next. What, as you're looking in the mirror and you're feeling naked mm -hmm. and another word that came to me was vulnerable. Well, mm -hmm. I don't want to put words in your no, mouth. No, that would be a correct word. Yeah. Okay. And you're feeling that vulnerable. What kind of a thought would you be having? You know what I mean? Yeah. I think a lot of it is, it's like an emotional tie um, to an event of my past. And that's, I guess, where I'm going with that is, is it's all that, it's like a, a muscle memory in a sense that just tr when it's triggered, it's like, all those same emotions come back yeah. from, you know. And what would be the thought? When you're thinking about the past, and let's say you're looking at that past, mm -hmm. and you have a thought about, about that, what, what do you think, or a belief about that, mm -hmm. what, what might that be? That I, I was, know that's a tough kind of question, yeah, right? I think, I mean, the first thing that I would say is that, like, being lost and not knowing it would be a, like a thought or okay. like a phrase to put in of what I see. And, and that comes from um, just when I was very young, like, you know, around 12 or 13, um, we had a babysitter who, um, while my parents were in Europe one summer, mm -hmm. had basically sexually abused me every night. Ah. And it was this event that um, I didn't know was wrong, I guess, in, in my mind. Yeah. I wouldn't say I guess that's a hedge word, but um, it was wrong, but I didn't know it. And so the way that it all kind of came out and was discovered was I had told my dad that I had done something wrong. And so when I approached him and, and told him, you know, like what was going on, I presented it in a way that I needed to apologize for something that I'd done to him and like, you know, disrespecting him or, or those things, mm. but they were things that were done to me. Mm -hmm. So then his response to that was, that's not something that you need to, you know, ask forgiveness for. Yeah. It's something, it's the complete opposite of that. And I remember in that moment, feeling like I had 
the wool pulled over my eyes that whole time. Like I was living, thinking that I wasn't doing anything wrong, and then here I was, and it was like, no, you did something wrong. And then when I brought it out, it was like, but it's not your fault. And I couldn't accept that because I was like, I just felt like, well, I was the one deceived. I was the one who didn't know. So it had to do with me. That's interesting. And yet, even at Christmas, and it sounds like at other times, mm -hmm. what gets triggered in you is that shame mm -hmm. and a belief about you. If, if I gave you a sentence, when you're feeling shame, mm -hmm. how would you finish that sentence? I am what? Hmm. I think broken. Broken. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like something's not the way it should be. Okay. And um, so something's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. broken, so etc. Wrong would be this. Yeah. Yeah. And are, is there are there any other thoughts attached to that? Like, oh, and that's awful, or that's horrible, to be that broken. Do you ever get to that kind mm -hmm. of thinking? I think it all comes because, like, my parents were pastors, and so there's ah. a lot of expectation kind of placed on me in yeah. it growing up and, you know, doing all the right things. And so I think a lot of that pressure comes with that because if there's something wrong with me and I'm supposed to be an example to other people and do all these other things, then that's kind of the next process is ah. that pressure kind of caves in with that shame yeah. and kind of creates this... I don't want to be that because I want people to see me in a certain way. And when As if, you really are. Right. Yeah. In some ways. But it's like, I feel so often in these moments that the person that people expect me to be, which I would say would be my true positive self, I oftentimes in these low points feel like the positive version of myself is a mask or it's not like who I truly am because if that was the case, then that would be what I go back to when I'm alone or when you know, different things happen. Okay, Steve, this was a really interesting part of the session, and he very quickly, um, you know, reports to you this sexual abuse that happened when his parents were away, and he was 12 or 13 years old, and you don't really focus on the past information. You're not asking him more about it. He tells you that he was participating. He felt that he had to confess, and his father said, well, you don't have to confess. He says, yes, I do. And you didn't focus more on the past memories or the situation. You really focus on your sentence completion activity to sort of focus on what he's thinking about himself now, kind of related to that. And that was a, a choice you made, not going into the past, right. but sort of focusing then directly from thinking of that past experience and what he's thinking now. How, how did you make that decision? Yeah, because I was really concerned with how whatever happened in the past. And, you know, in a later session, we may go back to that past, mm -hmm. but uh, he's experiencing the symptoms now mm -hmm. about what he, be, what beliefs he formed about that event, and those beliefs that he formed about himself are what are causing the symptoms now. So I wanted to go there. So whatever he construed about that event, yes. this is what he's thinking now. Yes. Let's get him to focus on that. Right, and I think if we were able to focus on that and get some change, he would be more hopeful okay. and less depressed. One, one other question uh, that I would observe, uh, his parents are both pastors. Right. He feels this obligation to be this you know, perfect self or it's sort of how he appears to the community. Right. And there's a lot of pressure on him to be a certain way or to have a certain appearance. Do you find this to be a, a common thing amongst people that there are related to clergy or <laughs> our clergy or are very religious? I don't want to get in trouble with the clergy, but... Um, yeah, they, should also, feel, they feel a responsibility. They do feel a responsibility, and I think they feel they develop some beliefs about the self and what that self should be. Right. And often they flip. To, and how uh, perfect they should be. Well, how perfect, all right? Oh, I can't do that, so right. I might as well do everything I want. Right. So, so he sort of has this idea yeah. that you know, given my family status, I should be a certain way, which is pretty perfect. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's see if that comes back, so let's go ahead. Have that version, but I only feel the lower or the negative yeah. version of myself when I'm alone and by myself. Yeah. So it's like there's no one to perform in front of, there's no one to share with, and so mm -hmm. in those moments, <coughs> it feels like it's more my true self because there's no one else involved. I have a question. and. Do you try to hide that from others? Because you would see yourself as broken and, I mean, in those times of shame. Mm -hmm. um, 
broken and you know how awful this is. Um, do you uh, or do you have concern or worry about others seeing that brokenness? I don't think so. You I, don't. So it's more what you do to yourself. Right. Okay. Okay. And so, well, and that's a very helpful because um, one of the things that we kind of believe in in this, you know, um, rational mode of behavioral mm -hmm. therapy is that um, situations are really important. In the past, it's certainly important. I mean, who would want, you know, a young person to have to go through mm -hmm. what you you went through, but we kind of believe that it's not so much that that causes our emotion, mm -hmm. but it's how we're thinking about that. Right. You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that that's kind of why I was asking you those questions. And it was very helpful to hear you say that, in a sense, you kind of put yourself down. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That you're broken. Right. Um, you don't live up to that ideal standard that you mm -hmm. think others expect of you. And in some sense, maybe you expect of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I would. And there's a history of that expectation given the family system. You were, mm -hmm. you know, parents who were clergy, and, right. et, et cetera. So, um, but we think that's actually quite hopeful, you right. know, because um, we can't rewrite the past, mm -hmm. but we could work on maybe changing those thoughts or those beliefs that you have that would be the direct cause. Right. Not the distant cause, but mm -hmm. the direct cause of your shame. Make sense? Right. Um, now, you told me that you're a, 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 a Christian. Do you see that? Um, is that consistent with your faith at all, that somehow what we believe is really important to our It emotions? does. Or it also adds a little bit of confusion to, mm. to me because yeah. um, one of the, the big triggers of this event, um, as far as like me coming and telling my dad, was that... I, a big weekend, like one of those uh, conferences, oh, I see. and it was uh, my dad had just done this um, s like series of the day that the workshop that I was in was in his workshop, and he was talking about um, like sexual sins and and those mm -hmm. kind of things. And so as he was talking, it started. I was like, oh, this is something that I've done, or this is something that has been done to me, and and I'm kind of fitting what he's starting to say. For the first time, I'm having this revelation that I this isn't right. Um, and so out of that, um, you know, we prayed afterwards and did all those things. And the whole idea with the Christianity is that, you know, you put faith into, you know, what God sees or faith into who you truly are. And then that's right. kind of what will become. And so my big, I guess, struggle was that um, I feel like I had done that for so long. And then here I am um, this Christmas, right? And all of it came back. Steve, in this uh, section of the video, his faith really does come out, and he reports, you know, sort of having this uh, workshop that he attended on sexual sins, and that he thought that he had sort of confessed it to his father, and he thought the faith was going to help him. But yet, given the faith and given the sort of sacramental confession, he's still suffering with it. So, what, what do you make of that? Yeah, I think the faith helped him in the short run. Right. You know, to feel to feel much better about about himself, that somehow the community accepts him and that God accepts him. The trouble was he hadn't accepted himself yet. Right. And I think in part because um, as wonderful as those, you know, sacraments and, and practices are within his faith, um, they may not have got down gotten down to the belief that he uses to continually make himself feel bad about himself. So the church and God could have forgiven him, but he hasn't yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. So the, the the real issue is how do you get those sacramental forgiveness into believing it yes. about yourself? Yes. Okay, and that seems to be where he is. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I okay, think. great. Let's hear some more. I was like, this is so strange because I felt like I had kind of dealt with that, not so much pushed it under the rug, but right. I had confronted it, I brought it up, I, you know, had some, you know, counseling in the sense of, like, it's not your fault, you know, like, yeah. you're, those kind of things, um, and then people prayed with me, um, and so I was like, okay, well, then that's great, and I kind of moved forward, and I think most of the people that I know and have grown up with would never know that I would be a victim of sexual abuse, mm -hmm. because all of my behaviors, nothing fit the symptoms, yeah. 
Then I have, you know, this Christmas thing. I meet this girl. She has a very similar background. We're talking about it. And then somewhere in there, all these emotions come flooding right back. And I'm thinking, like, I haven't dealt with this. And that's kind of the thought process was, if I feel this way, that means there's something still wrong, something still down there that I didn't truly bring out and, and deal with. Yeah. And so still... Um that belief pops up again that I am still broken. Right. Because, Something's really wrong yeah. with me. And looking back saying, well, on all this other time where I didn't feel broken, that must have been just an act or uh, just this false self because if the true me feels this way, you know, if that's yeah. what's down there. Like, I don't believe it was thrown on me from, you know, her or something else. Like, it was almost like I had these deep emotions and feelings that just erupted. Um, yeah. And that makes sense to me in mm -hmm. terms of the anxiety that would come then because the, the thought, and tell me if I'm wrong or mm -hmm. right here, but it would be that, oh, but what if, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I really am, you know, right. mo far more broken than I thought. I thought I dealt with right. this. I accepted forgiveness from mm -hmm. God or whatever, yeah. right? And now I find out that I'm still that broken right. and then there's some anxiety about what if, I don't know, do you ever have it? And what if it's always that way? Yeah, and, and feeling, maybe not so much like for the future, like this is the way that it will always be, yeah. but, but saying like, I don't know how to deal with it. Because ah. I feel like I used every resource that I could think of to deal with this, you know, like coming, like a lot of people would have, you know, like. Hi Steve, this is, uh, continues to be a really interesting session. And he talks about this uh, resurgent of this shame how surprised he is because he says he's used all these resources mm. that I guess are from his religion and yet he still feels broken underneath. And um, do you think this is a conflict or difficult thing for secular therapists to do? And do you, this is an area that you would like need a religiously oriented uh, therapist? What do you think about this? I, I don't think you would need a religious, uh, religious therapist. Um, I think a, a secular therapist could actually help this man very easily, especially I think uh, rational motor behavioral therapy helps with this because what he what he said was he's tried everything he could, mm -hmm. right? But has not gotten down to that deeper belief. He said that there is something still wrong, mm -hmm. and that something that is still wrong he believes is him, right? Rather than that something that is still wrong is the repetition of this belief that keeps causing those right. symptoms, right? And I think the 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 therapist could say, let's accept your faith and let's just go a step lower to see what you are telling yourself about this, even in the presence of the forgiveness of God and right. salvation. So that the idea that all human beings have equal worth and that yeah. none of us are condemnable would be consistent whether you were a religiously oriented therapist or a secular therapist. Right. That basic philosophical tenet of REBT is really what we're talking about here. Yeah, and I think, especially for a Christian client, that the fundamental belief is that they're created in the image of God. They're messed up, right. but they're created in the image of God, and you can get to that point. Okay, all right, great. And this was her experience. She didn't bring it up, and it caused a lot of trouble because it came out like 15 years later yeah. that she had been abused and these things. So there was a lot of different... Um, it was a much messier situation, yeah. I'll just say that. Um, and so because of that, I think, well, that didn't happen to me. I, I got it all out, so, you know. And then the anxiety comes from, like, I don't know what else to do because I've already done everything that I and thought I was think, supposed to. Do you think you, you should know? <laughs> I don't know. It's, right? it's just, yeah, it's one yeah. of those things. And when you have like a problem and you don't know the solution, but you want help and you right. don't know where to look, and that's kind of where I was. In That'd be interesting sense. to, and that makes perfect sense to want help, etc. Mm -hmm. Did it ever go beyond that to, um, but um, I just don't know how to do that. This mm -hmm. is, right. You know, this is yeah. terrible, and I should know what to, to do about this, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and what I felt know? like there was no one I could turn to because mm -hmm. I had brought it up to my parents originally. Mm -hmm. And so it's like almost not saying this against them, but it's like they couldn't fix it because yeah. I here it is again. So whatever that, and so going back to them was kind of this, I don't know what happened, but it didn't work, that, yeah. you know? So I'm broken, mm -hmm. I need to be fixed. Right. I thought I had done it. Mm -hmm. Apparently I 
didn't, so I'm still really broken, right. and I should know what to do. Right. This may sound like a very strange question. Mm -hmm. So that line of thinking, how does that help you? When you see yourself as this broken person, right, mm -hmm. who should have dealt with it and should know what to do with it. Yeah. How does that help you? I would say, I mean, the first thought that comes to mind and why I was thinking this was if I could at least treat it like a problem, then I could find a solution rather yeah. than what I thought I had been doing, which was like I thought I had the answer for so long. Right. And so for me, this was more of like saying I, I should, I should, I should in the direction of because of the, in the past I thought differently, and this is where it got me. Okay. But the... But does it help? I mean, in a sense, does that, by putting those shoulds on you, I should, and seeing yourself as this, you know, this broken, you know, person, do you get something positive out of that? I don't think so. In fact, what it gives you is what? I think a fear or fear? anxiety. Like, yeah. just, yeah, you know, when I put the responsibility on myself for those things, it's more out of a fear that if I don't think those thoughts, then I can't ever be fixed. Ah, okay. Yeah. Which goes back to your original response as a, as a, you know, a young boy mm -hmm. that, you know, I've done something wrong. Right. And so it's kind of submerging that, mm -hmm. right? Right. Hi, Steve. There's two things that I've noticed during this section of the recording, and that is, you know, the theoretical uh, irrational beliefs uh, that uh, REBT and cognitive behavior talk about are sort of these ideas about self-denigration, self-worthlessness, self-downing, and you never use those terms. Uh, you sort of consistently use the term that he identified in the beginning, which is broken, and you've stayed with his vocabulary. Is that purposeful? Yeah, yes. I think in REBT, and when, sometimes when you read the textbooks, You'll, you'll get a list of um, kind of the words, you know, an ideal vocabulary. Right. Um, and I think that's really important if you form that Wait, vocabulary. Why? Yeah. But he already gave me a word broken, and that, I often get that word when I'm working with conservative Christian clients um, because they look upon the brokenness of Jesus, and yet he had intrinsic value. So eventually I want to, even if he wants to see himself as broken, as having intrinsic value. Okay. Yeah. The other thing I've noticed is you could have taught him about the dysfunctional nature of his irrational beliefs, mm. but you've chosen to sort of be consistent in using Socratic dialogue. What made you make that decision? I like to begin with the Socratic uh, approach um, because I think it has the client much more engaged. And if they come up with the ideas, they come up with the <laughs> the realization that their line of thinking isn't helpful, it's, I think it's much more powerful than me giving them a narrative. Right. And he does seem to respond to your Socratic questions. He's very engaged with them. Yeah, he does. He's, he's a bright young man, and he's, he's, he does seem to um, respond really well with, to that Socratic method. Okay, great. Yeah. Let's go back. So that kind of uh, process just gets continued then. Mm -hmm. and, okay, so in a sense, what, what I hear you saying is it doesn't really help me to think in that way as broken and that I should be fixed and that I should have that solution, or at least I should know that solution, right. uh, doesn't make me feel unbroken. Right. Okay. But I'm afraid that if I don't think those thoughts, then I'll never be fixed. Yeah. Okay. And that that is your job. Mm. Yeah. To. Because I'm responsible yeah. for myself. Those are the, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Would you like to look at that? I would. Okay. I would. So let's let's say um, we, we call that like putting the self down as kind of well self downing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you see yourself as this broken individual mm -hmm. um, uh, and act out of you know that um, that that may be kind of proliferating the problem, mm -hmm. right? So what do you think would be another way to look at yourself other than this broken person who must be fixed and that you're the one that has to do it by yourself? 
Well, I think the opposite of that is obviously positive thinking in that sense of self-image and the things that aren't wrong or strengths rather than focusing on weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Those are just thoughts that come to mind. Yeah. And they're usually deterred, like I said, because of the fear that if, fear. if I think positively, then the negative will never... Yeah. You know. I'm not even recommending positive thinking. Right. Um, because, you know, we could flip and that could be just as unrealistic as right. you putting yourself mm -hmm. down for something over which you had no control, right? right? That's not helpful for mm -hmm. you. But to say, no, everything is pink ponies and rainbows is right. not, you know what I mean? Yes. So I'm wondering about a more realistic kind of thought. I'm, yeah. I'm going to just try something yeah. and see what, what you think might be an emotion that you might have. Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, I did go through something that was really negative. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't wish that on even my enemies, you know, mm -hmm. that, they would, that they would go through that. But that does not make me uh, broken. Mm -hmm. It means I'm someone who went through a very negative experience. Yeah. What would that feel like if you embrace that thought rather than seeing yourself as this broken person who needs to be fixed? I think calling the situation for what it is, not mm -hmm. denying it, mm -hmm. um, and moving into that would, I guess, start the road to confidence. Mm in the sense of the negative, like the self-downing or the thought process that I have against myself isn't very realistic either, mm -hmm. would be what I would understand from that. The, okay. the, the reality isn't that I'm you know, all put together or that I'm completely broken. It right. would be that I am a person who has experienced brokenness exactly. and has great qualities of strength as well. Yeah, and that sometimes when this habit, habitual way of thinking that I'm broken, broken and I need to be fixed, mm -hmm. when that kicks in, that's just going to cause shame. Right. Whereas if you see that, um, I don't know what you might experience other, but I'm wondering if you thought, you know, I'm, I was a young person who went through a very negative experience. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make me broken. It means, you know, that um, that was a challenge and I live with that challenge. I mm -hmm. um, um, wonder if instead of the shame, you might feel maybe some disappointment, maybe even annoyance, you know, that you mm -hmm. had to even go through that, you know, right. because it is unfair. Mm -hmm. Hi, Stephen. Listening to this uh, portion of the recording, it seems kind of clear why he's stuck, because he has this irrational belief that he's a broken person and he responds to it with positive thinking, thinking of his positive yeah. attributes, which doesn't really deal with the bad events. And, and you sort of help him create a, an alternative belief that this is always bad and it's, it is a bad thing that I have to deal with and respond to, but it doesn't make me. Yeah, Th that's exactly what I want to get at because this flipping between uh, um, uh, a negative self and a positive self uh, just doesn't work. I mean, he'll feel good for a little while and then something happens and he goes right back to that negative self-image. So I was hoping that if we could get him to, or help him, help him to see that this event is negative. Because there would be some people in the, with certain religious traditions that would say, let's call that a good event. I don't want to play that game. Right. right. Let's just say it's a negative event, let it be a negative event and let it always be a negative event. Right but that it doesn't define, it doesn't define him. And that maybe we can look at that negative event in a different way to give him greater freedom right. in his life. And he seems to feel very validated yeah. by mm -hmm. that kind of uh, statement that, it, that it's always gonna be negative and memories of it will always be negative. So yeah, and I think it's really important to validate the client. I just don't wanna validate that negative event defines him. Right, right? okay. That you are a victim. All right. What would it be like for you to experience some disappointment, maybe an annoyance? I don't know that that would be the emotion. Mm -hmm. But what would it be like for you to experience emotions like that rather than shame? I think there might be some anger more, mm -hmm. even than disappointment. Um, and not at the unfairness, but I think a lot of it Try to phrase this. 
I think I feel that, you know, with what my parents did and who they were, that not that it's unfair that we go through these things, but like that shouldn't have happened in that environment, if that makes sense. Like when I think that way, as far as I've encountered these struggles and, you know, I don't wish that on anyone, it's that I wouldn't want. And every, everything starts turning towards what my parents have done as being an environment for which that happened. And so the anger goes sometimes towards them or the ministry or church in general. Yeah. Because <clears throat> if I take that as like just being someone who's experienced these things, I think, you know, in how I grew up or, you know, in living a life that's supposed to be different than others, mm. that same thing happened. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know if it's so much an injustice as like, I don't know how that happened in what we would call like a positive environment. But then, yeah, I mean, I don't know if we would have time to challenge that one. Right, but, yeah. Um, that, um, but it is something to, I think would be really helpful for you to mm -hmm. look at that, because there might be the thought that this should not have happened, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it did. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and in a sense, how believing that it absolutely should not have happened will help you or not help you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because it did, and, uh, and it's not good. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't want to play that, and I know some Christians who might want to play, you know, that what I'm talking about right. there. Um, we don't want to pretend that it's good, but we're kind of putting another demand on it, right? That it absolutely should not have happened. Right. When that's the way the world is, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Steve, in this section of the recording, he introduces a new emotional problem. And uh, you behave a little differently. You know, you're, you're, you're more didactic. You haven't asked as many questions about the anger that he has. You're more didactic than Socratic. Now, what do you think was going on with you that you'd made this change here? Right, I, in, I was concerned that we would be go, going down another trail, right. a fruitful trail, because that trail, uh, the anger toward the parents and toward life would be a lack of unconditional other acceptance, right. or unconditional acceptance of just life as it is. But we were just making headway on moving toward the concept of unconditional self-acceptance and I didn't want to go down a lot of different trails. So in your, your head, I, I'm sort of like not done. Right. I, don't, I really don't know that he gets this unconditional self-acceptance and I don't want to start a new problem. Exactly, I just, yeah, I just don't know where he is yet. Right. And, and a little more talk, I think, in that direction. If this was an ongoing know. client, what would you do with that information? Um, About I, the anger and... Yeah, I might bring that up at the beginning of the next session mm -hmm. or if, unless they had something to, uh, to go down. My, my take is with most clients, it'll come up anyway at another right. time, you know. Okay. Yeah. So this is something you put on the back burner yeah. in a real case. Yeah. Or an thing, ongoing case. It, it is this lack of unconditional acceptance of, in a lot of different areas. Okay. All right, let's return. Um, but we want to focus kind of on the, on the shame right. and move toward you kind of accepting yourself, um, you know, no matter what. Mm -hmm there. How, how important would you say your faith is to you? I'd say it's the most important thing. It is. Yeah. So in this situation then I would have a, have a question for you. That you went through that and um, that very negative, um, very negative experience. And I'm wondering given your faith how would you think God or Jesus would see you just because you've gone through that the experience? Would he see you as an utterly broken person mm -hmm. who absolutely needs to be fixed and that you're the one that would have to do that? No, that would probably be opposite. Okay, yeah. well, tell me more. What would... I think, if anything, my faith in looking at the scenario would be that everything that has happened happens and for the reason that nobody is perfect and that what we live in is a fallen world. Um, and it's basically that all that's saying is that it's not the ideal 
yeah, okay. what we live in. Yeah. And that that has been caused by personal responsibility, but it's not something that we can fix with personal responsibility. Ah. It's something that is fixed through his responsibility, that being Jesus. Mm -hmm. So the idea of atonement takes off my responsibility of having to fix things and more puts it in um, having faith that he has done that. And if a person does that, I mean, when you, when you're mindful of that, mm -hmm. um, do you see that in any way of, of helping you kind of accept yourself rather than this broken person that must be fixed? I think I need to, I don't know, I'd like to move towards that and truly yeah. believe that. But then there's other times that I feel like I'm not even worth that fight or worth that death because. that he died. Um, because of, like, I was once at a, a baptism and there was this girl who came up and she read a letter um, of why, like, she hadn't really given her life to God. Mm -hmm. And the letter went something along the lines of, like, every time I mess up, it makes you, or you had to die because of my mistakes. And I keep making those mistakes, so I feel like I'm letting you down. Mm. And I continue to let you down all the time. And because of that, I don't even know if it's worth knowing you. And that was kind of the process. And then she kind of covered up with like a cute, how she you know, said this prayer and made her feel better. But I remember identifying that the true, what she was saying was the way I felt, that yeah. I didn't feel like you know, what I was doing. I was like, that's great, and I love that you know, he has a heart of love for me. But I feel like I just continue to disappoint that heart of love. And it's hard to look at someone who loves you no matter what when you keep making mistakes. Because it's not, it's almost like there's not a mutual thing there. Like mm. he would, will never make a mistake, but I continue to do it. And so I feel like if I looked more towards what he was doing as being, you know, yeah. always loving and always doing that, that it would help me deal with it. But constantly my mind keeps getting distracted yeah. by this. You know, but I keep and I keep looking back to myself and the and mistakes. And I should not be right. doing that. So another demand upon your mm -hmm. upon yourself. So we have a lot of shoulds here yeah. that you put on yourself. A mm -hmm. lot of pressure right. that you put on um, yourself. Look, let me just ask a question. If um, uh, a good friend came to you and they said, um, you know, I just want to tell you something that I've been keeping secret all this mm -hmm. time, a similar story to yours, and I'm really, really broken. I believe in God. I believe that Jesus died, you know, for mm -hmm. me. I'm included in that mass of humanity that right. he died for. Um, that, um, that, that I keep um, sinning. What would you say to them? And they go, therefore, I think I'm just unlovable. Mm -hmm. I am not deserving of, of God's love because I just keep screwing up. Yeah. I think... Would you say, yeah, that's true, you should just give up? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, what would you say? <laughs> no, I would say that I guess that's the point, that the reality is that, and that is why he continues to love, is because we can't, you know, we can't be perfect and we can't do those things, and that if we, if I, if we examine that grace yeah. long enough, we'll be changed. Yeah. And that it won't, because when you focus on that, you're not focusing on yourself. And I think a lot of times, even with people who have that thing, what I always say to them is, you know, you can't die to yourself by yourself. So, Steve, uh, this is a, another interesting part about this uh, session that I really liked. And one of the reasons that he seems unable to forgive himself is uh, the conclusions he draws based on that story from the girl at the baptism that right. he talks about that he identifies with that you know Jesus died for our sins and I keep committing sins and keep adding to the things that Jesus has to suffer for right. I'm certainly not lovable and how could Jesus ever love me back and I'm sort of unworthy about that love and that really seems to have him stuck right. in that, that little <coughs> religious theology there and uh, you sort of try to Move them away from that. What was your plan there? Well, at that point, I had two things going on in my mind, and I chose to go with the humor because I think it's an it's a heavy heavy one. But I thought that humor and and um, and he's such a sensitive young man, you know, mm -hmm. and cares about others that if I put it in the in the form of him having a friend 
who was just as he was, what would he say to them? And he was much more loving right. to that. The other thing that I was thinking was uh, from Augustine, who's, who has this famous line, Felix Kolpau, oh, happy fault, right. referring to the fall of humankind, oh, happy fault that we should merit such a redeemer, kind of a reframe of right. and, and not putting yourself down. Yeah, and this is sort of the first time that he's sort of accepting yeah. his infallibility. Yes. Right, that is sort of moving him in a step of self-acceptance. Yeah, yeah, accept that without the bottom dropping out and right. he's worthless, yeah. So, I don't know, I sort of like the Augustine quote myself. Yeah, do but, yeah like the post <laughs> would be good, maybe we had time to get to vote. Yeah. Right. All right, great. As in, uh, you can't look at your problems and then like lay them down in that sense you have to stare at a solution and mm -hmm. that by looking at the solution and kind of savoring that it transforms who you are and so if someone's caught in habitual sinning or they keep messing up that's the first thing is you know don't focus on the habit don't focus on that but focus on the solution as in forming a new habit not trying to correct the old one and could you tell yourself that I don't think because so. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. Well, yeah. so yeah, because what makes you so special, right? Yeah. That there's the rest of humanity, <laughs> you know. But me. I am the only one that is irredeemable and unlovable, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can even use, um, you know, when you're experiencing shame as like a cue. Yeah. Ah, you know, that means that I'm thinking these thoughts again. That's probably not real helpful right. for me. And... Um, for you, well, what, what would you see as something that you could do as helpful that would tap into the Christian message that you love, that there's actually a God that loves people who just continually <laughs> screw up, right? Yeah. Um, um, I'm wondering what you could tell yourself in that moment so that you tap into that, which you experience as mm -hmm. helpful and hopeful, it sounds right. like, but so that you don't kick back into well, you know, Jesus did this, but actually I'm the one that's going to have to fix it, mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of saying to God, you right. know, like, yeah. you know, and that makes bring me it upset on, but stop, right? Because yeah. I don't like that, and I'm yeah. like, and I see that in others, and I get, you know, it always triggers this, like, that's not true, that's not true, and then whenever it comes to me, I'm like, oh. Well, it, I have a word for somebody that does that. Yeah. Called a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just think that's a part of it, right? right. But when we demand perfection of ourselves, or, or at least I shouldn't sin again, right. then that just perpetuates that I'm broken, I have to do it, right. you know, and, um, and then you're going to, you know. I think then forming a habit of using these emotions as cues yeah. rather than identifiers. Yeah. It's like in, if I feel shame, it's a cue that my thoughts are going back in the wrong direction exactly. rather than saying I am a person who should be ashamed right. or I am broken like it's not it wouldn't be an identity at that point it would be a cue that a tool that helps me redirect right towards and solution. I think that's that's so key that if we separate what we're doing from who we are mm -hmm. and, and that can be hard sometimes right. um, and um, because the goal would be for you to kind of unconditionally accept yourself. Why? Well, I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> the why but. is because that's what God does for you, mm -hmm. right? And I think he's modeling, hey, try this. You might like it. You know? Okay, Steve, the, the session ends, and your, your last intervention there was asking him to take the experience of the emotion, the shame, as a cue to think the forgiving, you know, yeah. unfallible, and, for, and I can forgive myself, rather right. than the I am who, what I am what I did. Right. And uh, that sort of uses the emotion not as something I have to get rid of right away, but as a cue to a more flexible, rational way of thinking. Right. He seems to really identify with that. Yeah, he, he picked it up very, very quickly. And I think I went there because in the very beginning when he gave the example mm -hmm. of himself in front of the mirror, he said he experienced shame and then later on developed guilt right. about that uh, or you know another emotion. And I, I didn't find that secondary symptom to be real helpful. Right. And this time, I, rather than having him develop a 
very negative secondary symptom, I was kind of put, trying to put something in its place. Right. Let's just not get freaked out about the emotion, use it as a cue, and then use, um, you know, kind of dispute whatever that uh, negative belief is. And so he's got a more flexible way to think yeah. rationally when he experiences the emotion. Exactly. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that the friend issue you, you continue to talk about, and he was really clear that he would be much more forgiving and accepting of someone else. And you pointed out how there's a different rule that applies to him. Right, yeah. That, you think that is a common I think it's reaction? I'm a human, but I don't think you have to be a Christian. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Often we're harder on, uh, on the self than, than others. But I think there's something in, in certain interpretations of Christianity that will have you be really, really negative. But you know, there's also that narrative that they can tap into that gives them hope. Right. Um, if you were going to go forward in other sessions, what would you use from the information that you got here? Well, I would stay on that unconditional self-acceptance to mm -hmm. see how that might play out in other activating events. And he also gave me uh, a, a going down a, a line that we didn't pick up, um, unconditional acceptance of others, others. as parents. The anger issue. And uh, and end of life. That yeah. this, uh, a good Christian should not have to experience these negative. God effects. just fixed it for us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So and that one, I don't know. That would be very interesting to see if he was angry at God, and um, and if we could get that be, to be okay, then I think he'd be really flexible. You know. Okay. All right. So uh, interesting session. Thanks very much Thank for sharing you. with us. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. Um. Anything else you would want to add to, to that? If I can kind of sum up where we came, is that you're very helpful. You came up with this very clear example of something mm -hmm. that happened, the shame that came up. Right. And then you were able to identify the thoughts that you have that kind of cause that shame, lead to that shame. And so then we were looking at, you know, that's actually a helpful thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because we can't undo the past, but we right. can change the way that we're thinking. Right. Or as scripture would say, hold captive those thoughts, right? right. And, um, and so we were looking at how to do that. And one of the ways that we could do that is challenge that that way of thinking is just not helpful. That's just right. going to maintain me in shame. Mm -hmm. And brings up that other thing that you talked about is, and it's utterly self-focused. Right. You know, when I want to just kind of let go of that. Right. You know, just accept the self kind of unconditionally. Um, but that we could, that you might try, as you said, really much better than I did, that you could use that shame as a cue that your thoughts aren't real helpful mm -hmm. and then, you know, begin to, um, uh, you know, challenge that, challenge that, right. that thinking as not only unhelpful, but, um, not even realistic. Right. No. Okay. But, and so in this therapy, we always like to give homework. Mm -hmm. I don't like that word. But yeah. um, after what we've talked about, what is something that you could, that you might be able to do, um, you know, um, concrete, that you think would be a good step to move you to decreasing the frequency and the intensity or the duration of that shame when it does kick mm -hmm. in, you know, that will just go away overnight, right. but because um, this is a process, and in some Christian circles they call that sanctification, right? right. So um, that would be a step in that process in the right direction. What, what do you think you could do? I think bringing it to a practical level is um, not blaming, like, myself for why things aren't turning out ideal mm -hmm. and I think that's a lot of even what happened during Christmas in this relationship was when something went wrong I said what did I do ah. and and that was kind of it like did I do something did I say something and I kind of just started analyzing that and that led to like deeper levels so instead of looking as as things going wrong as something that I've caused um, use them with like the helpful reminders of when something goes wrong not to assess it as pointing to me first, but looking at the situation in reality and saying this is what happened and I am a part of that, but I am not yeah. that. Okay. And then forming, I think, 
for me the shame cues into redirecting my thoughts. Okay. And I guess in this situation it's very practical because it doesn't involve me trying to fix the situation. Yeah. It involves letting it play out and me not beating myself up yeah. because of how it plays out. Yeah. But recognizing that's just the way that things happen and yeah. people have to do the same thing that I have to do and that's look at the situation and not instantly blame or instantly blame self. Yeah, exactly. So would it work for you to Let's, I'm going to assume that's going to happen again, mm -hmm. right? It's, right. Um, therapy can be powerful, but mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it just doesn't make everything fine overnight. But if you journaled that process, would that help? Do you write? I do. Do, do. So I do. do that. And then I'm, adding, I'm thinking, like, something that we could do even when the shame gets triggered. Mm -hmm. And maybe a short phrase you could tell yourself that would remind you, okay, I need to stop and analyze it. I may not have time right now. You know, right. especially if you're giving a presentation mm -hmm. and Shane kicks in, you can't go, okay, people, let me <laughs> yeah. walk you through the thought processes yeah. I'm going to do. But a short phrase you might be able to tell yourself in that moment just to get you over the hump, right? Yeah, it's not about you would be something that comes in my okay. mind. Okay. It's something, I think it's quick and it's something that um, redirects my focus mm. as, as looking at the scenario and not... Okay myself I think that would be helpful for me I've also I've journaled for a while now so like even during this whole process of like Christmas and things all those thoughts are written down and I think it might be I don't know helpful for me to look at those and see where that language that we've kind of discussed was used yeah. and see how that that played into my emotions at that time and what I what um, in the future I can do to change that language that's kind of in those areas perfect I think that would be fantastic mm -hmm. to do that and then analyze that. And in a moment, you could go, you know, actually, let me try rewriting that right now, right. you know, and see what I could tell mm -hmm. myself so that you're practicing, practicing that. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you. So is there um, anything else that you I don't think, think so. we should I think add this to been, this? This has been very helpful. Okay. Well, thanks again. Yeah.